here with you and to welcome you into my neighborhood for those of you who have come from farther afield. I live like three blocks up the road. So <laughs> this is a nice place to start my morning. Like so many of you, I am here for personal reasons. On the stage, as a state senator, and as an ally and accomplice for folks with disabilities. I became an advocate at a pretty young age when my sister Olivia was born with microcephaly and significant disabilities and chronic medical needs. I was seven years old when Olivia was born, but I remember understanding that not my parents, not the doctors, no one knew how long Olivia would live. I also remember that we didn't know how we would pay for her complex care if and when she did survive. Not even my dad's government employee insurance would have covered the cabinets full of expensive prescriptions, the multiple wheelchairs, the G-tube and then the J-tube, the pump and supplies, the inflatable vest that kept her from getting pneumonia more than five times a year. It was expensive and baffling and scary in a time when we were trying to grapple with this new reality for my family. So when the legislature expanded Medicaid in 1993, we felt a huge burden lifted, huge. We could focus on keeping Olivia healthy and building a rich life for her instead of worrying if we would lose our home to pay for her care. Through Olivia's and my family's experience, I learned what a critical role that the government can play in keeping people healthy and giving us the tools that we need and removing the barriers from our ability to build rich lives for ourselves. And thanks to that expansion of Medicaid and the loving care of my family, the hard work of dedicated professionals in our community, Olivia lived a vibrant life for 19 years. Olivia made me a big sister for the second time. She also made me an ally and accomplice for folks whose voices aren't being heard. It's because of her that I'm in the Senate and that I'm here with you today. I'm also here because my dad, who contracted hepatitis C and a bad army tattoo, died of complications that had he lived just a little bit longer, may not only have been treatable, but curable. And I'm here because as a queer woman, I've experienced the struggles of seeking healthcare in a system that wasn't built by people with bodies and lives like mine. Those personal experiences help me see much more clearly the flaws in our system and the cracks that our families, our neighbors, our fellow Washingtonians continue to slip through. And those experiences led me to spend more than a decade working to expand opportunities for kids for communities of color, for women, for the LGBTQ community, and for folks living with disabilities. That work showed me how important the state policy could be. And that's why after 2016, I felt compelled to run for office in a place where I grew up, where my family and my friends and neighbors live, where I could fight alongside my community for the change that we deserve. Now, I'm fighting those fights in the Washington State Senate, alongside so many of you. What drives me is bringing the voices of neighbors who can't make it to Olympia, who have so much on their plates that bringing their voice to advocate on a bill is just too much. I bring the voices of folks who have been systematically kept from being a part of the decision-making process, who aren't represented in our elected officials, who are fighting to live their fullest lives, but also fighting to be heard. Many of you know that our Senate structure, in our Senate structure, there's not a standing committee solely dedicated to the issues facing with people with disabilities. You know, there shouldn't necessarily be just one, right? We live rich lives that intersect with so many different areas. But the fact that there's not a committee means that we don't have a deep 
bench of knowledge in our staff or our members. We don't have folks who have really dug in and work session after work session on the issues that are impacting all of us. I believe that fact means that it's my responsibility to push to integrate our voices, our needs, the issues impacting the disability community into the work that we're doing in each and every committee, on each and every bill. In each and every work session, are we asking, how is this impacting folks who are not at this table? Some of the strong progress that we made this year came in an area that you might expect if you know that it's the bulk of the uh, legislature's budget in K-12 education. We promoted and expanded support for social emotional learning. We improved early learning access for young children with developmental delays or disabilities, expanded free preschool to more low income children, and crucially increased the special education funding multiplier, the way that we figure out how much money our school system gets for the students who are learning in it. But we made strides in other areas as well. Here in my community, or in my committees that I sit on, transportation, health and long-term care, higher education and workforce development, I'm bringing disability issues to the table. So let's talk a little bit about each of those areas. In transportation, an uh, issue that impacts all of us, especially those who are struggling to navigate um, the space and safety, I sponsored a bill to make our roads safer for what are called vulnerable road users. What that means is folks who are using not cars to get around. For pedestrians, for bicyclists, for motorcyclists, and for folks using manual or powered wheelchairs, we want to ensure there is safe passage distance so that all of us can move around our communities more safely. This bill strengthens the penalties for drivers who endanger folks who are not in cars and puts that money into uh, education funding for drivers and law enforcement. I also supported a capital uh, funding request for the Warren Avenue Bridge, which is just down the street. We recently expanded our other bridge, the Manette. It's beautiful, should you get a chance to travel over it. Um, but the Warren Avenue Bridge doesn't have safe passage for pedestrians, for bicyclists, and for folks in wheelchairs. And we were able to put, get money in the budget to ensure that we can expand that pedestrian access so that you know, two people can cross each other on the path and not be put in an uncomfortable position. It's, it's increasing the way that folks can move about our community safely and fully engage in all that great cities like Bremerton have to offer. I'm also fostering conversations about other ways that our state's transportation system can be more accommodating and accessible. I've heard from constituents how important it is that ferries are more attentive to the needs of folks with disabilities. I talked to a number of parents who are struggling to, like, with a wheelchair van, tell the um, ticket booth operator and then the person who's loading them where they need to be so that their um, lift can provide egress. Um, you know, I think the ferry folks are really working hard on learning what, how to do the right thing, but you know, every van is different, every mobility device is different. So in order to be able to load folks so that you can get out and get upstairs and get something to eat, just like any other um, ferry rider, we need to do better and build a better system. We also talked about um, ensuring that there are adult changing tables in the ferries if possible. You know, this is, there was a day the, um, a couple weeks ago and there's a you know, national movement we're advocating for this need that no one talks about, that um, for folks with severe mobility impairments and medical needs, go just taking the ferry to a medical provider in Seattle can be rife with struggle. And we can do better, but we have to bring those issues to the table, and that's what I'm working on doing. I also serve on higher education and workforce development and have the real honor of moving from vice chair of last session to acting chair today, and knock on wood with the vote of my colleagues on Friday, um, chair next session. And 
On that committee, I am working on ensuring that we are building a pipeline to higher education and supporting folks who are seeking post high school credentials and, and um, access to the job market and ensuring that we're supporting everyone along that path, not just the traditional higher education students, not just folks who, for whom it's most accessible, but removing the barriers for folks uh, for whom higher education is least accessible. There are several colleges in Washington that are doing really exciting work and they're national leaders in providing inclusive education opportunities. Highland College, Skagit Valley, Bellevue, Spokane Community College, and Wazoo here in Washington. They have really exciting and innovative programs to support folks, but I want our entire community college system, I want all of our four years, I want our independent colleges also to be thinking about ways that they can build better structures to support students with a variety of needs. We need to always be thinking about supporting every learning type because there's not just one and there's not one that's the most valuable or the most useful. We all learn in such different ways and folks who have been kept out of college classrooms, who have been kept out of opportunities for growth, need us to be thinking about what their support needs are. This year we passed a landmark bill, the Workforce Education Investment Act, which invested an additional 375 million in our higher education system. 375 million, that's a huge amount of money. It's a nation leading investment in higher education access. It significantly increased the baseline support to community colleges and granted our public colleges and guaranteed that our public colleges would be free to the lowest income families in Washington. Um, I think the numbers say about a, a family of four that makes 50K or less will have access to free college in Washington State, which is so exciting. But it's not enough. You know, paying the tuition is the first step to ensuring that higher education is accessible to everyone. We need to make sure that the student experience is robust and supported and helps us to think about every student. My third committee is Health and Long-Term Care, where I serve as vice chair. And this year, Health and Long-Term Care was the busiest committee in the Senate. We had the highest volume of bills, and we made real incredible progress for Washingtonians who are struggling in a healthcare system that is broken. Due to the hard work of sponsor Eileen Cody, who has worked on this issue for years, I don't want to say how many, out there, but, um, as well as many advocates, including I know some folks in this room, we removed the income and maximum age restrictions on eligibility to buy into Medicaid health care for workers with disabilities. This is amazing. <laughs> for so long, I have heard um, individuals and family members talk about the struggle between wanting to work more hours and losing their benefits. This is so real. And this change is, is really world changing. It's allowing folks to continue to depend on, on our incredible Medicaid programs and work the hours and the careers and the wages that they deserve. <laughs> I was the sponsor of the Senate bill um, that ultimately became law, but I am so proud that we were able to unanimously pass that House bill through the House and the Senate. We also went further and ended, we banned surprise billing, which hits folks with unexpectedly large charges, you know, especially anesthesia. You know, if you go, you do the work, you ensure that you're going to a provider that's in network to get your service and then weeks later, sometimes a month later, you get this bill for an anesthesiologist that's huge and so unexpected because you did that planning. And, and what this bill does is ensure that that negotiation process on the cost of that anesthesia that wasn't in network but should have been happens between the payer, you know, your insurance provider, and the um, care provider. Takes 
all of us, the patients, out of the equation, as we should be. We also tackled the problems with our state's healthcare system as a whole. To make a difference right away, our new Cascade Care Program will provide the nation's first public option for healthcare. There are an increasing number, especially on the Kitsap Peninsula, of folks who are um, dropping out of the exchange, who are you know, not buying health insurance anymore because they don't have employer-sponsored health care, they don't have state-sponsored health care, and it's too expensive for what they're earning to be able to buy health care on the private market. And Cascade Care is targeted at those folks, highest risk of being uninsured in our community. We're talking about young folks, we're talking about working people, we're talking about business owners and folks who work in small businesses. This is an essential way that we can get care that's reliable, that has a kind of set expectation of benefits to people who need it. Anyone with a body needs healthcare, right? So we should all be able to depend on the coverage that we need when we need it. And Cascade Care is just a start. There are um, targets that we want to hit for out-of-pocket maximum costs for your premiums and options for state subsidies to really pull those levers down if it doesn't end up getting as affordable as we want it to, as quick as we want it to. But we also were able to create the Universal Healthcare Work Group, recognizing that we've got almost half a million people in Washington that have no healthcare coverage besides the emergency room. And that's making them put off care longer, making their care more expensive in the long term, and making the whole health system more expensive for all of us who are paying into it, you know, with our tax dollars, with our premiums. Um, we want to ensure that everyone has that access to care. And the, the Universal Health Care Work Group met for the first time last Friday, and it's not quite as big as this room, but it's a robust group of 30-ish folks who represent all of the healthcare space, who are doctors, who are you know, even insurance providers, who are the state treasurer, who's gonna help us figure out how to pay for it, patient advocates, um, you know, folks from unions, folks from small group insurance, everyone who has a, has a finger in the healthcare system is represented. And I am really looking forward to the year ahead where we make real progress, put together a plan to cover everyone in Washington State. We also passed the Long-Term Care Trust Act. Does anyone, did anyone follow that legislation? Washington, again, is a nation leader in, in a social benefit for long-term care. So many folks in our community aren't able to pay the cost of long-term care when they need it, weren't able to pay for the long-term care insurance that would have helped them you know, throughout their life didn't know to expect this, um, you know, an accident, an illness, a sudden disability, and needed help. And for many years, uh, the legislature here in Washington, led by new speaker designate Lori Jenkins, has been working to pass the Long-Term Care Trust Act, and this year we were finally able to. What it means is that folks will pay in through a payroll deduction and anyone who has worked a certain number of years in a window of years will be able to take advantage of a year's worth of long-term care coverage in home. Um, it won't cover you know, the high cost of a skilled nursing facility, but it will cover a guaranteed benefit of $36,500. That's about $100 a day. So if you need a ramp built on your house, if you need if a family member has to take time off work in order to be a caregiver, this is going to provide uh, for some of the basic needs that are really causing families to struggle. Um, what we're seeing is so many people having to spin themselves down into poverty in order to get support for their care needs. And in a state like Washington, in the you know wealthiest country in the world, that is inexcusable. And this Long-Term Care Trust Act is going to support families who really need that support for that period of time that is a, allows them to be a bridge before they qualify for something else. But despite the progress that we've made on issues of aging, we rank among the top in the country. 
We are at the bottom of the barrel in investments and services for people with disabilities. That's why I joined the Joint Legislative Executive Committee on Planning for Aging and Disabilities. That's the committee that pulled together the Long-Term Care Trust Act that has continued to advance um, support for our ULTSA and our aging services. Um, but it hasn't focused enough on disability issues for folks under, say, 64. Um, we have a lot of unmet needs, and I was especially excited to be selected as co-chair um, of this committee so that I can help shine a light on those unmet needs. Folks who have been sorely neglected by state leaders for too many years. There were severe cuts during the recession. We weren't at the top of the pile before the recession, but we certainly haven't clawed our way back from those cuts to our support services to allow folks to live a rich life. Our agencies are stretched so thin. Here in Kitsap County, Medicaid long-term care has a caseload of 92 clients to one case manager. It's one of the highest in the state. And it is a struggle. DDA, the DDA office here in Bremerton has a high ratio of two, 75 to one. Can you imagine, I'm sure some of you can, what it, um, what it takes to provide that care to 75 individuals who are navigating a complex and broken underfunded system. Our state's needs are only increasing. The typical increase in the DD caseload is 10% a year. And last year we saw a 14% increase. We know that these numbers are only going to rise. Here in Kitsap County, with Naval Base Kitsap, we end up as a um, sort of magnet spot for service members with um, family members with disabilities because there are um, great resources here in the community, but it just means that we need to plan better. And right now, we're not really planning at all. Um, the aging services do caseload forecasting, so modeling years out how many people we expect we need to serve and what their needs will be. The DD system in Washington does not undergo caseload forecasting. So our budgets are never meeting the needs that are growing. And that's something that we can work to do. It sounds like a simple fix. It's a very expensive fix, but it's one that we need to push. And I'm happy to say that in the first meeting of the Joint Legislative Committee on Aging and Disability Services, we had that conversation and it was bipartisan. There were um, members that I wouldn't expect to, to say, let's plan to spend more money said we need to make caseload forecasting happen. So that is a fight I am ready to take up and I hope that many of you in this room will be with me when you have the time to come to Olympia or write letters and um, offer public comments. Another important way that we can shape a more accessible Washington is through the capital construction funds that the legislature grants to communities around the state. I recently had the joy of seeing a project funded by the capital budget in action here in Bremerton. There's a playground at Evergreen Rotary Park not far from here. It was a dream of a group of moms um, who created a beyond accessible movement. They knew that the bare minimum of ADA accessibility for playgrounds still excluded many kids who had greater needs. It excluded parents or grandparents who had mobility impairments who couldn't help um, you know, safely play with the kids that they were bringing to the playground. And they knew we could do better. They worked for years to raise money from the community and to advocate to the city and the state for those needs. So now on a beautiful summer day, you can see kids of all abilities running or wheeling across the turf, that easy path, you know, from the sidewalks right onto the play surface that's not pea gravel that will get wheel stuck, that's not wood chips, that is unsafe. Um, it's awesome and it's spongy and safe. And there are you know toys that have transfer stations. There's a braille clock that kids can play on. There's a little sensory dome um, that allows kids to like cuddle in and find a, a space away from stimulants. It is really exciting. And it's not the only beyond accessible playground in our district. There's 
and in Kitsap County. There's also one on Bainbridge, there's one in Gig Harbor, and there is a new playground also at Gateway Park on the Key Peninsula. I am so excited to have so many resources here in our community and thrilled to keep working to expand them across the state to make sure that every community is accessible for everyone who lives in it. Those are the kind of projects that we need to support. And in addition to my committee work, I worked on a bunch of bills, um, a Senate companion to one that many of you know about and many of you worked on, which bans state agencies from playing sub-minimum wage. I didn't realize that this was a practice until I came into the Senate and um, some folks in this room explained to me the struggle that we're facing, the civil rights issue that is staring us in the face. The practice of paying folks less than minimum wage legally is atrocious. You know, I, I talked to a lot of folks who um, have complaints for, about their employer, um, and I help them file wage theft complaints um, with LNI, and and I just don't see the difference. Minimum wage exemptions are being phased out all across the country. Bipartisan um, efforts are moving, led by individuals with disabilities, by self-advocates, and their allies and accomplices. The states of Vermont, New Hampshire, Maryland, Alaska, and Rhode Island have eliminated them, as has the city of Seattle. Bipartisan bills have been introduced in the U.S. House and Senate this year, and we started the conversation in Olympia. What I've heard from self-advocates and seen in the data is that some minimum wages, this is not a surprise to any of you, aren't in the best interest of anyone. <laughs> when Disability Rights Washington investigated the use of some minimum wages in 2014, they found that one, Many people with disabilities were being paid substantially below minimum wage, and often the employer had not even applied for a certificate. And two, that they were engaged in segregated settings, lacking the opportunity to interact with other folks in the community. And three, that there was little effort to find opportunities for them to work in a competitive setting at a prevailing wage. For me, this bill was about recognizing the dignity, the valuable skills, the inherent value of workers in our community of all abilities. It's also about fighting back against big corporations like Pepsi Cola, who say that they can't pay um, minimum wages to folks who are working in uh, contracts and paying some minimum wage, and that lights a fire in me. You know, this is about ensuring that folks who can afford to pay are paying what people deserve. It was a contentious issue this year, you know, for anyone who wasn't following it closely, and it took a lot of work to educate our colleagues. Representative Frame, the sponsor of the House bill that ultimately passed, did a terrific job explaining to other legislators what was at stake, and so many advocates, including folks in this room, did so too. So I'm so grateful for all of your work and I think you deserve an applause. <laughs> you know, bringing your personal stories is, can be the most impactful way to change legislators' minds, but I wanna recognize the emotional labor that it takes to do that. To put yourself on the line and explain why you're worthy, why you're valuable, why folks should pay attention to the issues impacting you. I don't think we recognize that enough. We ask so much of folks to bring their personal stories, to make it personal, to fight the fight, and I don't want you to stop doing it. I think we need more of it, but I also know that it comes at a cost. And one of the things that I want to continue working on in Olympia is making uh, remote testimony more accessible, making it easier for folks to communicate in different ways with legislators so that we are supporting the needs of folks who are spending so much of themselves to be a part of the process. 
you know, I don't have to tell any of you about the wonders and importance of supported employment opportunities and the need for uh, the Washington legislature to better fund and support them. This summer I have been traveling around the state visiting supported employment sites and I have had such an amazing time talking to employers, talking to, um, you know, case managers and individuals working at these jobs. And I think, you know, I think about, you know, if my sister would have been able to have a job, I think about the kids in my mom's class, she's a paraeducator in the Life Skills Program and South Kids at High School, and, and just about the ways that we can build a richer participation in our community, we can build a richer workforce for folks of all abilities, that allows us to work alongside each other, to understand each other's lives better, and to learn from each other. Some of the great um, supported employers in our community are part of Community Employment Alliance, that, and they are doing such hard work in Olympia and on the ground here in the real world. Those opportunities to nourish a policy ecosystem in which we all continue to grow and learn. You know, some employers from Morningside Services to Olympia, to Vetus and Tukwila, Holly Ridge Center here in Bremerton, employing folks with disabilities as part of their mission to provide specialized services and care to countless children and adults, including my sister Olivia, who benefited from the Birth to Three Early Intervention Program. They're close to my heart. I also spent a lot of time recently with Trillium. Yeah. <laughs> and got to chat with an employer at Hops and Drops in Silverdale um, who had such an interesting journey in his understanding of supported employment and what it means both for the employees and for himself. He had had a tough experience years ago with uh, uh, with an um, agency that, you know, just wasn't working. You know, he struggled to meet the needs of the employee. He didn't really understand. He didn't have a good relationship. And so he had sort of written it off. So when the folks from Chilliam first came to his door, um, he was like, mm, I did that. I'm okay. Um, but they kept at him. Um, and we're able to make uh, a really compelling case for why we should try again. And now he has so many employees and is thrilled at the work that they do for his restaurant, the work that they do to engage other employees, and the work that the case manager is doing to better um, equip each one of his employees with some really new and meaningful skills. There's a, a worker who um, got really excited about prepping cheese sticks, um, but needed a little help, like doing it in the best way for him. So um, the folks from Trillium helped like, uh, fashion a specific like cutting and prepping device, um, a mobility aid that would let this guy do his work best. And now, each one of the Hops and Drops restaurants is using that device to prep cheese sticks, no matter who's prepping them. Like, we are innovating in our workplaces, and there is no end to the growth that we can see. I also was at Skokum Contracting Services recently here in Bremerton, um, at the headquarters, and chatted with you know, many, many, many employees and heard more about their growing national presence. And, you know, this, here in Kitsap County, and I think in the state as a whole, as legislators should, um, my colleagues have a, a real respect for our service members and, um, you know, are often more at the ready to provide support for folks who are veterans. And I think the story that Spookum can tell about the complex needs of disabled veterans and other folks experiencing disability in our community 
is a great story and one that I think will continue to bring folks along. Uh, it's hard to find out what what's going to work for each individual legislator. I often um, am asked in you know from folks across the state and especially folks who have been denied access to rooms where decisions are made, who have not had a seat at the you know, budget table, who have not been able to, you know, who aren't serving or don't see anyone like them serving in elected office, how they can impact change. And what I tell them is that they have something to offer that others don't have that lived experience, that hard-won expertise, the wealth of real-world knowledge. And I strongly believe that those of us who are closest to specific problems are also closest to the solution. Usually, we're just farthest from the resources that we need to make that solution happen. And it's so important to be involved and to continue using your voice and your advocacy, recognizing again that it's hard and that it comes at a cost. But know that I am always here to both be a listening ear in the, in the legislature, but also to help you strategize about other legislators that you're looking to make strides with. You know, I, I used to work prior to the legislature in the fundraising world. And I would describe my job as a lot of first dates. Um, you know, I would, I would sit down with a potential donor and I'd get to know them and figure out what motivated them and try to convince them that it was their idea to give my organization money. Um, and, <laughs> and that's what pushing policy feels like in Olympia sometimes. You know, especially as a new constituent who hasn't been to the Capitol before, who's never sat down with a legislator, who knows a lot about the issues that you're working on and has that lived experience, but maybe doesn't have experience lobbying or even asking for money. And, and so I recognize that it's weird and awkward and uncomfortable and you feel rushed and you've got 15 minutes to sit down and then someone's knocking at the door my legislative assistant, Sarah, who always keeps me on track. Um, but it's worth it. And it's going to be awkward the first time, just like those awkward first dates. But the more that you can practice, the better you'll feel at it. I won't say the better you'll be, because I think you're really great the first time that you show up, and you probably are better than you feel like you are. But you will feel more comfortable. You will hit your stride. Um, but if you're ever, you know, feeling like you want to have a conversation with a legislator and a friendly one, you can call us and talk through what your pitch is um, and, and practice. Or, you know, put our, we can put our heads together, figure out what the best strategy is to move your issue forward. Building those connections, drawing on the ones you already have, coming to the table with a broad coalition and deep knowledge, those are ways to make people in power listen. And, and that's why I had uh, this summer a meeting of DD stakeholders. We met in Tacoma to talk about some of the issues that are facing our community. Because I think under that subminimum wage battle that we had this year, the, the fear that a lot of parent caregivers experienced about you know, what their child's life would be like if, they, if their employer had to pay them more and so they cut their hours and they didn't have other supports. That fear was about our broken system and the lack of funding overall and the difficulty navigating it, the overburdened case managers and the shortage of funds to get the support that folks need. So I want you all to take away from here the understanding that I'm committed to the fight for the long haul. I'm committed to working with you to ensure that we're forecasting our caseload, that we are thinking about ways to increase the pipeline to, to service providers, 
that we are looking for innovative solutions to education and employment, that we're thinking about internships. We've had a conversation with our internship coordinator in Olympia about how we might create a more accessible internship program for folks coming from the community college setting or not a traditional four-year degree. We are really excited to work alongside you, to learn from your experience, and to push forward Washington State so that we are once again in this arena the leader that we know that we can be. So thank you so much for letting me spend the morning with you, for all of the work that you do in your community, and I look forward to chatting with you um, in, in community and in district, but also in Olympia when we're in session.